the masses into the new media counterculture and away from the media establishment. Here is the king of podcasts. Here we go. Episode 251 of the Broadcasters Podcast. This is KOP. Thanks for listening in. Thank you for finding the YouTube channel. If you found it at broadcasterspodcast.com or youtube.com slash king of podcasts. Thank you. Thank you so much. So glad to have you on, listening in, wherever you subscribe to the show, Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever else you find podcasts. Tonight I want to talk about something that's been very, I've been working on trying to find out the best way to kind of take this topic and move with it, because it's not like there's a whole lot going on that I could really bring up, but I think there's a couple of stories that I can use now recently, and some just currently that will help me with my argument here tonight, a, a really a topic point, a talking point I've been wanting to bring up for a long time. Now, you might remember on the program, I don't know how many times I might have talked about it, but maybe you might remember me talking about there's two different kinds of culture. Of course, there's the mainstream culture and the counterculture. Now, with that said, I have talked about crossover. You might remember. Back in April, when I talked about the Coachella crossover and how UK rap might be doing better than American rap, well, I brought that up before. And I brought up counterculture many times before because there was a time where you could see mainstream culture embrace it. And here's what happens. So your counterculture is doing its thing parallel to the mainstream culture. The mainstream culture being controlled, all the media that you see, whether it's digital, streaming, you know, music, movies, TV, and radio, controlled by all the corporate media giants. So when you think about television, of course, you think about CBS or NBC Universal or Disney owning ABC or and Fox, right? You think about radio, you think about iHeartRadio, you think about Cumulus and Odyssey and all these other com- companies. You think about music and you think of BMG, Arista, Sony, Universal, all these major music publishers and record labels. And then you think about what tell you know, and then you think about with movies, you know, it's you know, it's the Paramounts, the MGMs, the Columbia Pictures, the uh, Universal Pictures, all these different things, right? Major major media conglomerates. And there's a thing where they allow certain things that come from the counterculture to cross over. That's it. So we used to have a thing in particular. And it really, in music, it changed in 1991 when Billboard decided to change the algorithm, the makeup of their Billboard Hot 100 chart, which made it different for what songs would be listed. Because you look at the chart back in 1991, back in, I think it was about September 1991 was the last year of the chart, being as it was the original Hot 100, which is what the American Top 40 countdown that Shadow Stevens hosted at the time was using. But then they went to a mainstream chart, which still had a little bit of the intonations of what the crossover, what, what, what might cross over, but then it would continue to be homogenized. It would be moved away to be much more pop, much more pop. And then anything that was rap related, anything that was country or rock related, it had to go ahead and fit into that role to where those artists had to be specifically there. So they didn't have any credibility amongst their peers when it came to whatever it is. Like, so now you have artists that are just. They're not respected by the true hardcore of that genre. Now they're just something else. So we look at who's out there now. Okay. And then you just say to yourself, all right. And that always happens. Okay. What happens is you'll have something that is crossover. And then you know what happens after that, that artist will then, you know, they might not stay in the limelight in the mainstream for long. They'll have their hits and they move along. And just like every good artist. Okay. Then you have your concept album. Then you have other things that you're doing, and everything changes. And things weren't like that before. There was a thing where, because I talk about Billboard so much, the thing is Billboard allows us to actually see what the audience engagement is, what the audience measurement is, of what the real audience is doing if they're buying records, if they're listening to music. 
you get a real feel of what music's out there that people are really in touch with. And that's the thing that I thought was so important about how we always saw certain shows and certain movies, certain TV shows, certain radio shows, and all this stuff, where crossover allowed us to delve into other cultures, appreciate other music out there, appreciate artists. Like a lot of what we enjoy of other cultures we learned because it became mainstream. Think about it. My big fat Greek wedding. You think about dirty rich agents or crazy rich agents, right? You think about, I mean, there's a lot of things that are like that in various communities. And, um, and let's just say like this, every different, all these areas of diversity, equity, inclusion, not including transgender, because at the time, transgender would have been considered under LGBT anyway, but we obviously know that people are trying to make that kind of a separate outside of the gay community. The transgender is, but is actually pretty much could be considered outside of the, the whole gamut. That doesn't matter if it is or not. But what I'm saying is, there were people in the counterculture where they were all accepting. And that was the best part. When you think of people that were in counterculture, but then delved in the mainstream, they gave people chances. And things came of it. And I think of various people that they made that possible. And look, you can agree or disagree, but when you look at the movie Elvis they put out earlier this year, and you see all the different soul and blues acts that came to the forefront because of Elvis. When I think of Dusty Springfield, and I think of all the Motown acts that she was able to go ahead and showcase, with her and Vicky Wareham, her best friend, working on the show Ready, Steady, Go, and how the Motown acts actually got a chance to go over there, and where British people got to experience Northern Soul. They already knew Northern Soul. They already knew the Motown sound. The songs were got brought over there. The records were being imported. But then the artists would come on to this Ready, Steady, Go show, the precursor to Top of the Pops. And you'd see Dusty Springfield, who knew all these artists. When it comes to Martha Reeves and the Vandellas, when it comes to Otis Redding, when it comes to the Supremes, when it comes to, you know, pick them. All these Motown acts coming over, to the fact they got James Brown to come on over. All of this. And then you say to yourself, all the artists... You know, they didn't get a chance to get as noticed in the UK. But you know what? In America, sure, you had stations that were doing their own thing. Black stations, Hispanic stations, white stations. But you know what was going on, too? Some people, there's a reason why they always talk about race records. But I'll tell you what. Those that broke the gamut and said, you know what? There's music we're going to go and pick up anyway. It doesn't matter. And they did. And so what happened was, you would see them pick up music, and say, okay. Sure, there was a point where the mainstream culture tried to go ahead and take the music that black artists were making and recreate it with white artists. But we saw what happened. You know, Pat Boone can go out there and do whatever he wants to go and recreate a record. Okay, he did it all the time in the 50s. But anything Little Richard put out, or Chuck Berry, or, you know, Pick, those songs got to the forefront, and those songs made it into the mainstream. They crossed over into the Hot 100. They all did. And there are various songs in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s where you saw lots of examples of music crossing over. You think of all the major stars you've seen. Stevie Wonder, Aretha Franklin, Earth, Wind, and Fire. You think about, you know, Luther Vandross. You think about Babyface. You think about Tony Braxton. You think about, you can go across, across the board. There are so many artists that got to be recognized. They were deemed successful. They got to sell records. They got to sell out concerts. And the Billboard Hot 100 was a gauge of showing what the American people that were the buying public, that didn't care about where the music came from. They didn't care about the whole story behind it because now that's becoming, that's taking away from the entertainment. It's taking away from the content. The music we love, people expect us to care about well, the person. Sure, that's a point, but it's not the priority. It's the music. It's the message you're giving, right? And so, in crossover music, Wikipedia puts a very good lengthy post, and you know, I'll go to Wikipedia to get some information on every artist out there, so right? And so, when you go back, you say to yourself, okay, 
there's country, there's Latin, and then you have Christian, you have jazz, all of this that came across. And it's been going on for years. The Latin explosion, we had Ricky Martin and Christina Aguilera and Jennifer Lopez and Mark Anthony and Enrique Iglesias. And their music sold like crazy. And they're still very much on top of the game. You look at country, the same thing. When you, or Gloria Stefan, you can say. Or you look at, you know, country music in the same way. But that music became mainstream. It crossed over. And now you can't, you can't help yourself. And same thing with rap. NWA might not have gotten all the way there yet, but you know what? Dr. Dre did. The old Criss Cross, Young MC. Hey, you might have, they might have been a little bit, you know, not as hard, not as tough. MC Hammer, same way. But you know what? They opened the door. They were the gatekeepers. They opened the gateway to having other people that would have never explored the music. They did. The little Ice did that too. Because how many white kids or Spanish kids would go pick up a record from a black artist? I think of my own personal thought, okay? I think about shows like In Living Color. In Living Color opened me up to hip hop because I really wasn't into it, not even to the extent until I saw that. Or Yo MTV Raps or Rap City. When those channels were on my lineup, it was a little bit tough for me to kind of embrace because, you know, when it came to music, hip hop was not all the way there yet. You know, we always, you would think about the early 80s, mid 80s, it was still very much R&B and you'd have some music that was be, you know, the cameos of the world, ready for the world, Levert. You think of Luther Vandross or Barry White and I'm thinking, when I heard a Barry White song, I tried to listen to it while I was listening to 99 Jams back in the day, late 80s, but I wasn't really like, I just felt like, okay, I can't get into him yet. Like, I'm 13, 14 years old. I don't get him yet. And he's doing Treat You Right. And I'm like, that voice is so deep. And I just didn't get into the songs. And that's okay. But then we get, go forward and we see artists that become mainstream. Like, look, how many movies have we gotten that were just all of a sudden, all the different artists that have come across that crossed over into the mainstream of different actors? Sidney Poitier. You think of Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman. Right? You think of John David Washington, Denzel's son right now. And the crossover of how they can go ahead and go across different spectrums of movies and do a great job. Because that's what they did. And they can go across all different gamuts to put whatever performances they want. And same thing with the Spanish market. You can also think about, you know, with Andy Garcia. You can think, we, you know, he crosses different spectrums. You think Charlie Sheen, Martin, uh, Martin Sheen, uh, Milly Estevez, right? There's just all this crossover that always gets lost. And I feel like it's the same way we're like, okay, when you look at a different city, like a major metropolitan city, which is consumed with mainstream and counterculture. It's a great example. I'm going to take an example and tell you exactly how it works. There's a story I found about the city of Detroit and where things are now. And the aspect of gentrification. So, there's a story that came out from YR.media. I'm going to pull from. It's called Revitalization or Gentrification. How a rebuild is changing the Detroit, Detroit's culture. Detroit is a great example. When you think of Detroit from the beginning, you think of Motown. You think of, you know, where the cars are built. You think of, uh, there's a lot of things we don't even think about. That what identifies with the city. Chicago. You know how they talked about after Beyonce put out the record uh, Renaissance about how Chicago was a home of house music and house music predominantly black music. When you think about disco in the 70s predominantly the best acts, almost all of them were black. Exception of Bee Gees. Exception of, uh, you know, I'm sure there's Casey and the Sunshine Band. You can think of other names, but really, predominantly black and Hispanic. You think of GQ? I mean, you think, really? I mean, it's like that. 
And th- so I look at this story from Detroit, and I'll think, okay, the story comes out, and they talk about how black residents are coping with displacement. Because there is a displacement right now of the counterculture. So here's what they talk about. Detroit, better known as Motor City, mecca of auto, auto, automotive innovation industry leaders, the big three companies, the center of racial integration of black Americans into popular music with Motown Records, founded in 1958 by Barry Gordy Jr., named after a play on the Motor City moniker, springing many black R&B, soul, and doo-wop artists in the crossover success. Crossover. And when artists were previously overlooked and copied without receiving their due credit, Motown Records artists like Marvin Gaye, The Jackson 5, Stevie Wonder, The Supremes, Gianna Ross, Four Tops, and countless others would create and popularize the Motown sound that would define much of the 1960s and beyond. The music at the same level as the British invasion coming in. And they dominated. And then you think also, we don't even talk about Stax Records, we don't talk about, you know, the Philly sound and all the things that were going on in these other states and these other cities building what they had. But then we know that the city had urban degradation in the 20th century and fast suburbanization and the city filed for bankruptcy. They've tried to work their way back. Well, right now, Detroit is still one of the most significant cultural centers in the United States. The genesis of techno. Did you know that? Techno was born in Detroit. This is true. The home of the Coliana restaurant, the birthplace of modern automobiles, and the influence of so many groups. And it's attempting to challenge to characterize Detroit's culture and words. And different cultures, a melting pot in Detroit, which, by the way, Miami the same way. You're talking about music being a cultural icon there. You're talking about musicians, movies, you're talking about the TV, the radio, the whole climate down there. All these different cities have that, and that's what's encompassing what everybody should have. A melting pot where people will delve. Listen, when people want to go and try out new food, you have somebody that will have you try it out, and you know what? You start going to the neighborhoods. You want to go to those holes in the wall. You want to go try out that food. Because sometimes you know that you don't have to go and like for, look for it in some suburban kind of gentrified environment, some fusion kind of thing. No. You want to get the real deal. This, if I want Jamaican food, I will go down to Fort Lauderdale. I'll go down to 441 in Oakland Park. I'll go to Carl's or I'll go to Donna's. And I'll go there and it's like a little bit dumpy. It's a hole in the wall. But the food is fantastic. And the people, awesome. Great vibe, great environment, great food. And the place called Lalo's I went to actually down in uh, Lauder Hill for an event. That's a great place too. Great food, by the way. And the comeback city is suffering from success. There have been efforts to revitalize the city and incentivize transplants from other parts to move, and they've seen side effects. So yeah, when new people come in with different ideas, they're going to neglect the culture and what made that city great. And that's what's going on now in our entertainment. It is. There's no doubt about it. And so Detroit shows us here when we should be revitalizing our counterculture to be able to have crossover again, where the music, where the message of whatever content it is, if it's a TV show, if it's a movie, if it's a song, and that song gets played on the radio, that should be something. And when I think of all the different songs that had messages, you know, political music, you think of Fortunate Son, Creedence Clearwater Revival. You think of Edwin Starr's War. Okay, you think of those songs. You think of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Ohio, right? I think of Bob Dylan's You Better Love Somebody, right? Or I mean, There's a lot of songs like that. Politically Charged, Rage Against the Machine. Green Day, you got it. But the music helped you understand the message. And because it was so pliable, it was so absorbable, you enjoyed the music, you would listen to the message. What a great way to get the message across. One of the guys I work with at Cannabis Radio, you know, he's a, a former musician, and we talked about this when I used to produce a show for a number of years. I'd always talk about this. Why don't they do the music? Like Woodstock, politically charged. But the music would do something. Band-Aid. We are the world. USA for Africa, right? Various songs, various ways of getting the message out. For whatever reason, that stopped. There's another, there's another story I want to take here where they talk about 
when disco died, right? That's just what like the soul was what it was. And, and by the way, one of the best examples of crossover of of real culture, Soul Train. Soul Train I watched. Soul Train a lot of people watched. Along with American Bandstand, along with Solid Gold. We all watched that in the 80s. Soul Train was great. And I'm telling you, if you ever get a chance, if you can find it, it's on YouTube somewhere, but Terrence Howard, who did the documentary on Soul Train, I think it was his 50th anniversary. Let me tell you. Or 40th, I forget what it was. But like the whole story of Don Cornelius being able to go ahead and get the show and have full ownership of the product. And the fact that he would take certain artists that would, you would never think would be on a show like that. But this is the whole point. I went back and looked at some of the songs that were put on and portrayed on Soul Train. Okay, a number of songs that were out there. When you think of the song Fame by David Bowie, and you look at what it was doing on the charts at that time and how popular it was, okay? You know he had a, an iconic performance on Soul Train. But what you don't know is, why was he on there? He wasn't just like all of a sudden. Don Cornelius saw when an artist was doing well and the songs were going up the Soul Chart. Let's give him an appearance. That's what happened here. So here's what it is. So in the weekly chart, on the Billboard Hot 100, 1975, David Bowie's fame hit number one. Number 17 in his home country of the, of the UK and on the, on, the, on the official chart. Number one, Canada. And top 20 in a number of other countries. On the rock chart, the hot rock and alternative songs, the hot rock songs chart, number 14, it peaked there. On the R&B chart, or the soul chart, it charted number 21. Because of that, Don Cornelius invited David Bowie on. What about Elton John and Benny the Jets? He performed that, right? And you think of that song. Well, that song, when it charted 1974, number one song of Billboard, Hot Soul Singles Chart in the U.S. for Billboard, number 15. And he got an invite on Soul Train. Another person, Gino Vanelli, the first white artist to go on that show. And there was a song he did, and I'm telling you, I'll still, I can't forget Charlie Wilson of the Gap Band saying, you know, I thought he was a black artist. He had a black sound. And he says, I was one of them. They didn't know. He was Snoop talking about Elton John. It sounded like he was, white. he was black. He didn't know. He didn't know. And I was like, amazing. But it's true. And so people got to move with a song that got up there. What a great song. And let me just put it there like this. Now, people got to move did not chart. Not necessarily. But you know what happened was? Because of his first appearance on Soul Train. The song was doing well. It did something. It was number 22 in the U.S. on the Boobaroo Hot 100. AC chart number 17. And then all of a sudden, he appears on Soul Train, and guess what happens? You go on and follow his career after that. His songs hit the R&B charts, the Soul charts, regularly. I Just Want to Stop, number 21. Living Inside Myself, number 45. And he said himself on that documentary, once he went on Soul Train, his audience went from mostly white to predominantly black. Because the songs were great. You know, it was fantastic. And you also think of other artists in the same way. When I think of, you know, Tina Marie and Square Biz, another artist like that. But it's like, it was crossover. It happened. And those things were, I mean, I remember watching Soul, I mean, Saul, Saul Gold, and I'm watching Isaac Hayes doing Don't Let Go, which a song hit the pop chart. It hit it like number 18, 1979. He's on there. You know what he's doing? He's also, you know, performing with Tom Jones in England, right? He got his, he got his own show. All of that. There was a harmony together. That was normal. You think of all the shows in the 70s and 80s and 90s that we all see as iconic. You think of Sanford and the Sun, Chico the Man. You think of Jefferson's Good Times. You know, I mean, the portrayal, you're going to say what it's going to be because it's going to be, oh, well, these were all white writers. Oh, okay. 
But still, representation, that's important. But music was a great example of this across the board. Dennis Coffey, they did the song Scorpio. He also appeared on Soul Train. It was all this. And Thede Wonder, after the tour, after being on Soul Train, it says here, Vanilla, Gino Vanilli got invited to go on tour with Thede Wonder. How about that? I think about Richard Marks. And he did a lot of records, and I'll tell you what, one of the songs is uh, he does is um, <clears throat> Keep Coming Back. I think it's an, <clears throat> it should be a 1990 song. Soulful, a little bit jazzy, very smooth. And you know who helped him write the song? And who's in the background lyrics? Luther Vandross. It's a great song. And it just helps me identify more with why things were so good. And disco music was a great example. Now, once it got, once the mainstream took it over, because the mainstream had to go and destroy it, and Steve Dahl, disco demolition might, might as the symbolic symbol of let's just shut it down. Disco kind of still stayed around, but it just became predominantly black as it was, and then it would change. But here's what William St. Val on his blog at Newsbreak.com he writes about this and says that you know, 1970s we had two new radio formats of African American audiences gravitating towards. Retro Nuevo and Quiet Storm, and they were coined in the response to Disco's declining popularity. And then it was a new blend of R&B, pop, and dance music that became popular in the early 1980s. Both genres featured soulful, slow jams. Quiet Storm tended to be more mellow and introspective. Retro Nuevo had more of an upbeat feel. Regardless, both genres helped to create the sound of urban contemporary, mu te urban contemporary music, which Grammy, the Grammy Awards wanted to go and change that. But you know who coined the term urban contemporary? It's a crossover format. Frankie Crocker, WBLS FM. He's the one that coined it. A predominantly black disc jockey in New York City. He created that. And because of that format, many artists were in prominence thanks in large part to Luther Vandross, Anita Baker. Both were steeped in the smooth rhythm of blues tradition. It was more palatable to a wider crossover audience than some of the grittier blues-driven music coming out of genres like Southern Soul. And urban contemporary came to encompass a, a wide range of artists from different racial backgrounds. Phil Collins part of that. Phil Collins with Phil Bailey on Easy Lover. You think of Shaka Khan, Janet Jackson, Jeffrey Osborne. <clears throat> and then in the 90s, it changed even more. Because then you had New Jack Swing. You had fashion, a fusion of change with rhythm and moves and hip-hop. And again, getting popularity among fans, among genres, and it was blending together. And it just all changed. You had producers like Teddy Riley, Babyface, L.A. Reid, contributing to the musical style. Artists like Bobby Brown, Blackstreet, TLC, Tony Braxton, Boys to Men, Mary G. Blanche. And by the way, all those songs, all those artists thrived as crossover. Thrived. It was so different at that time. But with Disco, it was across the board. And there's one story I wanted to take that was in here, and I'm, I'm going to go back and look for it real quick. But there was one story I was looking at, and I'm saying, where was that? Uh, there was a story I talked about where they talk about Sylvester, gay, black, musical artist, who put two songs into the, into the Billboard Hot 100 in 1978 with his album. Two Tons of Fun, which will become the Weather Girls, which will become uh, Martha Wash, and I forget the other lady's name, but I'll tell you what, became famous. And Sylvester broke the door, and would just open the door for being that artist that just really personified and just became a role model. You're talking about, like, the music, fantastic, dance, disco, heat, you made me feel mighty real, excellent songs. Excellent. And everything has changed. And I mentioned Soul Train. And talking about a show that was the epitome of crossover. And, and you really felt like everybody could just be there and cannot combine. Remember, he had various people that were in political uh, avenues would come on to the show. Jesse Jackson would come on. And you look at what he did. And there was a story from Dana Sanchez at mogul.com 
11 Things to Know About Don Cornelius Productions. 1970, the show Souls Train first came out in Chicago. He did it for the Board of Trade. That's where the show was taped on a local station there. And it was a small local production, blended gospel, R&B, soul music, local town to local viewers. You had the OJs, you had the staple singers, you had a lot of great artists that were on there that would then be, eventually would follow the trek to Los Angeles when the show went there and went syndicated across eight markets and then across the rest of the country. One of those markets being Miami, by the way. They talk about how the idea of a black-owned show for creating a black audience featuring black performers was revolutionary. But there was also a paradigm shift in American mass entertainment as a result. That's the point. And the show would feature professional amateur artists in R&B, soul, dance, pop, disco, and gospel. Introduce hip-hop artists to a national audience in the 80s. Taught a new audience how to do the robot, the hustle, and the bus stop. Syndicated by a black-owned brand. He hired black crew and dancers work for free. A targeted format to TV. The show also spun off where you have the Music Awards, the Lady of Soul Awards, the Christmas Star Fest. It's all out there. Soul Train Records. Took time for advertising revenue to come across, but it did. And he sold the rights to the Soul Train series for undisclosed amount. That intellectual property still holds up today, and it still means something. It still means a lot. So I bring up all that wonderful goodness about crossover. But then there's the artists that represent today's crossover. And they don't appreciate it. And a lot of things are not appreciated. Let me talk about it. Lizzo had an interview a few weeks ago and made some comments that were like, wow, I can't believe she'd say this, but okay. But here's what she said. Now, Lizzo, we already know, predominant hip-hop artist, or, you know, you can say R&B, but really it's hip-hop, pop. That's what she is. And she said to Vanity Fair, she had a feature story there, she says the truth hurts about her crossover success. She says, quote, oh, this is Melissa Vivian Jefferson, 34-year-old Lizzo. She says in the November cover story, the thing is, when a black artist reaches a certain level of popularity, it's going to be a predominantly white crowd. I am not making music for white people. I am a black woman. I am making music for my black experience, for me to heal myself from the experience we call life. Her music is rooted in R&B, hip-hop, and even gospel, but she scored pop hits with Juice, Good As Hell, and About Damn Time. And while she may have amassed legions of fans while her Grammy-winning breakthrough 19, 2019's Cause I Love You album came out, Lizzo says that she was speaking to black women first and foremost. Quote, we need self-love and self-love anthems more than anybody. So I'm making music for that girl right there who looks like me, who grew up in a city where was underappreciated and picked on and made it feel unbeautiful. Yeah, it blows my mind when people say I'm not making music from a black perspective. How could I not do that as a black artist? She says that the way black women have been treated in this country have, been, have made me feel very hopeless. I don't think there was a time where we were treated fairly and with respect. If I see hope in this country, it will come from the accountability of people who have the privilege. As a fat black woman, this country has never gone forward. It stays pretty much the same for me. We've seen progress. We've seen artists that are able to go ahead and listen. Entertainment many times has no boundaries. But you know what? You can't, you're not going to cross all racial lines. There are people that are racist, period. We know that. Very clear. And there's a lot of people that don't want to say they're racist that they are. But I'll tell you what. Her songs, Truth Hurts, About Damn Time, they're number one songs. They crossed over. And trust me, she gets a lot of commentary from the black community. And sure, there's a lot of white women that, or the white girls or Hispanic girls that are probably listening to her music. I still remember Juice. I like the song. I remember she was going to do well. I heard her. I heard her music in the UK first, a year before I heard Truth Hurts in the US. Like America came was last of the game, but Lizzo's music was already starting to pick up everywhere else. I remember Lizzo's song Juice 
And I remember hearing it, what was it, like 2017? And I remember hearing it, it was on the Spotify's Today's Top Hits, because I remember I had just picked up Spotify for the premium, and the song charted on the official chart. It did. And I was like, this song's really cool. I don't know who this artist is, but I like the song. It was bouncy. It was fun. Oh, it was 2019 she released. Okay, but still, when I saw it, and I'm saying to myself, okay, the song came up, but in the U.S., it didn't hit that well. It didn't chart that well. In the U.S., the Rolling Stone Top 154 on the Hot 100, number 82. It got up to number 38 in the U.S., in the U.K. official singles chart, the official chart, and I was like, oh, great, great. Let me check her out. And by the way, Okay, the R&B chart, 27. So the song didn't get much of play, but nobody really knew she was. But all of a sudden, she comes back in, and she blows up. And now she's a fi- she is a fixture of pop culture across the board. But that was like right off the bat. And by the way, her music, you know, she's about, the music is not for, black, or for white people, but you know what? How about Mexican people? It ranked number six, that song, Juice. What about Croatia? It ranked 16th. What about South Korea? It got in in their top 100. What about Scotland, 14? What about Israel, number four? I'm just saying, you know, there's something to be said about her music crosses cultural boundaries. Her music crosses over. It can't just be black women, and it just, I mean, you can go ahead and say that because that's what she wants to say, but the truth is, her music crosses a lot of boundaries. Culturally, she's very important, so she should focus on that and not downplay her audience because if she wants to make the black, black, black women a priority, great, but don't alienate the rest of your audience. For what? Be successful. How about not just fat black women? How about fat women in general? Women that feel underappreciated. They feel like they need to be empowered. They need to be body positive. You are the example. You're the role model for them. So don't just alienate yourself to a smaller percentage. It's women in general that will look up to you. Another story that came up and I thought was very interesting is that one of the people that was comparisons that she didn't want to be compared to. One... Tina Turner. What? How do you want not to be compared to Tina Turner? One of the best artists that had been in front of us for, I mean, how many years? Shit. You're talking about somebody that had, like, an easily a 50-year career. 50s to the 2000s. An incredible, incredible record of music. All those stuff she did with, with Ike and all the pressure and the abuse she went through. Talk about something that really that was destroyed. Like really that she came back, a full comeback with Roger Davies at home. And the eighties to the nineties, and she just rocked solo star and just blew up again. When you didn't think it was gonna happen. And you think of the songs that she had and how they charted. And you look at everything that she did, and all the songs that she did that just did so well. Because she crossed the laws across the board. All her songs with Ike and Tina Turner, a lot of them, would reach up into the Billboard Hot 100. Just how it was. Because every time it hit the big, top of the sold chart, it would rank in the Hot 100. So people were listening to it, a lot of people, for years. And so Lizzo has an issue about that. She talked about how she was recalled being surprised by the white crowd that filled sister seats, Rosetta Tharp and Tina Turner. She called out names like Diana Ross, Whitney Houston, and Beyonce as examples of black artists who reached a level of fame where large white audiences at the door. Now, she also said that, paraphrasing, from the story from the Spider News, the criticism bothered her until she met black women who felt her music was seen and inspired. In her own words, she can chill back and have a cocktail because she's comfortable with the direction she's going with her music. The more mainstream she goes, 
the more she finds who cares. Ah! Great. That's the part I didn't see for the Vanity Fair, or Fair article. Why didn't I see that? So that's great news. That she really realizes that. But there are some people out there that want to just show that she doesn't care. And that headline, I don't make music for white people, I'm a black woman. But then we go into the story and we learn now. She actually feels her music is seen and inspired. Black women have endorsed her. They have validated her. She's done her job. She accomplished what she wanted to do. And her music is going mainstream. And more people care. So your audience, they love you. She makes good music. Listen, uh, to be loved, I wasn't necessarily into the song right away, but it kind of had like the juice feel. But you know what? I kind of picked up on it. I was like, gave it a few more listens. Okay, I'm bopping to it. It's good. I like it. I guess it was the commercials they put it in. It didn't really help. But seriously, her music's good. I like it. I like it a lot. Good. I know about the albums, but you know what? I can appreciate what she does, and I like the hits. They're good. She was top 10 for so long until Taylor Swift just blew up the whole spot and took over every spot of the Hot 100, which is a problem. But I'm not going to get into, into Taylor Swift. That's only for one week. Can't stay like that forever. And then you think about rap music, and I'm like, you had a formula. You had a way to get artists to be crossing over. And how many artists did we have that crossed over? 50 Cent, Nelly, Ludacris in the 2000s. Drake. You know, you think about Kendrick Lamar also crossing over. Lil Baby gives a little bit of that taste, but not so much. Young Boy Can Ever Broke Again? Not so much. You know, really, he doesn't get there. But there are no artists who are able to go and cross over. You think of R&B artists, you got Usher, you got Chris Brown that are still doing it today. Jason Derulo, still doing it today. All of that. And so Rolling Stone talks about, and this is an unfortunate story about Takeoff. Who was killed, one of the members of Migos, we already know about that. And there's a story that got brought up from Rolling Stone, talking about how Migos met Drake and changed rap forever. So, retrospect on the career, the life, and times of Migos, who now you only have, uh, now you're where you are right now with the music, and there's it. There's not, that's all there is. There's nothing left. Like, I don't know if Migos continues to go on with just Quavo and, off, and Offset, but that's it. We don't know. And so, those talking about with Migos, the concern with 2013 to 2020 as right in the middle of forces of racism, capitalism, a constant source of tension within, within hip hop confronted the dawn of the streaming era. And Migos would get a viral hit that would change everything overnight. Their breakthrough hit Versace. And then Migos would go on to dominate the mainstream and alter the sound of rap for good. Because they did. And you look at what they did and how they moved themselves all the way up. And the whole story really talks about a whole lot of going on where DJ Drama, an uh, Atlanta mixtape king who had a scheduled slot, where they got a chance in Atlanta to go ahead and work on a concert and be featured. They got to meet Drake. And at the time... When Drake was starting to go and work with them. And he became the on-ramp to the pop mainstream for emerging rappers. He treated regional rap music like an obsessive fan. Scouring the internet for a few sounds. So Drake, for all the criticism we get, he is important because of all the star artists we have now that we've gotten the chance to hear from because of him. He said back in the day, don't get it twisted, I fuck with Migos. Yo, I'm just letting you know they have a wave. I'm just letting you know. And then the collabs came around, and all of a sudden, Migos blew up. Big. Super big. Atlanta, they found their way through. The, the story that has happened for many artists back in the day. Regional sensation, they begin, hit the crossover, they hit the mainstream. 
And Atlanta has done it to many artists. Outcast, Ludacris, Goody Mob. Well, Goody Mob wasn't as mainstream, but they were very prominent. And there's others. When you think about it. And so you just look at what they did. And then the songs they would come out with that would just blow right up. And then the career they made for themselves. Founded in Lawrenceville, Georgia, right? And you look at the songs that he did. Fight Night, Look at My Dab. Bad and Bougie featuring Lil Uzi Vert, a number one song. Motorsport with Nicki Minaj and Cardi B. 2017, picking at number six. Stir Fry, picking at number eight. Walk It, Talk It featuring Drake, 2018. Top 10 song. And there's such a story behind them. And they were not without their own issues when it comes to all things that happened to them. But like I said, they crossed over. Drake allowing another artist to cross over. And those things happening. Are we getting that so much now? Not so, not so much. But you see that happening. And you see certain artists are able to go and cross over. Like, let me tell you like this. Ed Sheeran does a great job of that. He doesn't get the credit in, here in the States, but in the UK, working with Stormzy, with Burner Boy, with Central C. Like, he just, he, he's working with other artists, like the rap game, he's working with them. He's working with Cardi B, he's working with Camila Cabello. I mean, he crosses over. He brings people into this fold. Justin Bieber the same way. Letting Giveon and Daniel Caesar a spot on Peaches. Number one song, by the way. Crossover still happens. It's just not as much anymore. <clears throat> but you would get this going on, and then it was a matter of... Then you have artists like Giveon that would get a chance to go and then go out and hit her on his own, and then you have Anniversary, and all of a sudden, here we go. He's just blowing up. And his song charts. Heartbreak Anniversary. And like, okay... And there are others in the same way that will find their way up. I feel like Doja Cat's, Doja Cat's done that before. With Saweetie, with SZA, all that's going on as well. Cardi B's doing the thing there right now with Glozilla. And I'm just saying to myself, man, and she had her song that she did with Bad Bunny and J Balvin, right? And I think of Bad Bunny as another artist, as an example of crossover. And a number one song with uh, I Like It, right? You go into that. And then you move along and know how he is using his, his platform to be politically active as well. You probably didn't know that. A story from Washington Post talks about that. He's more than a global superstar. He's a political icon. So let's go into the story from Bad Bunny. There's a DJ they talked to on here, Adam Romero. He's a 21-year-old student, and he talked about how he works at a night or a nine-inch at the basement night spot, a party bar, a nightclub popular with Pennsylvania State, Penn State University students, and the airways shift from U.S. chart toppers to Latin dance music, stretching from salsa to reggaeton, including Bad Bunny. And he talks about how when he plays Bad Bunny in the club settings. It can relate to each and every single person that is in there. The music crosses cultural barriers, crosses over. And so since 2016, Bad Bunny has seen a seismic rise. Most stream artists on Spotify Global for the past few years, his latest album, Un Verano Sin Ti, has tied for the most new weeks at number one of the Billboard 200 chart of any album in the last decade. And you know it. People know Bad Bunny. They hear the songs. They don't know the words, but man, they listen to his music. They've heard Titi Member Pregunto. They've heard Bascal Mule. They've heard, you know, Después de la Playa. They've heard Neverita, because you've heard that song. And he's a particular re re residence to young Puerto Ricans on off the island. He has unabashed pride for Latino communities in the Spanish language, defiance of traditional gender norms, and push for justice on a range of social issues. He went to the streets in 2019 to demand the governor, Ricardo Rosello's ouster. He put out a song called Afilando los Cuchinos, Sharpening the Knives, with Puerto Rican artist Residente and Ile. He has a new song called El Apagón, The Blackout, documenting the island's ongoing housing, electricity, and corruption crises five years after Hurricane Maria. 
to which he even kind of put an attack on Logan Paul. And Logan Paul had a gun, you know, tossed back. But, of course, hey, I mean, that's what's the whole point. In September, he hosted a survivor of the Valde, Texas school shooting at his Dallas concert, made lo donations to help the family buy a new home through his Good Bunny Foundation. So there are many La Latino musicians who aspire to become crossover artists, but Bad Bunny is sticking to creating music for global audiences in his native tongue. He doesn't have to accommodate to a English-speaking audience. He thinks it's something that Latinos admire and speaks to them. Inspired prior to what it means to be Latino. He has his uh, festival performance over Labor Day weekend called During It's Made in America. Telling fans, Made in America, Latinos make America. Encouraging fans to display flags for future, future, uh, representing a range of Latin American countries. And that's what you do. <clears throat> now, fans hold Bad Bunny up as challenging the traditional machismo, also the uh, characterizes the reggaeton. Yeah, he's flamboyant. He doesn't mind being a little bit uh, where he crosses gender boundaries or gender norms. They talk about how he was dressed in drag in his Yo Perero Sola, I twerk alone music video. He wore a skirt and a t shirt that called the attention to the murder of the transgender woman in Puerto Rico. He kissed the male backup dancer on the Tonight Show with starting Jimmy Fallon. Or next week, he kissed the male backup dancer. During his MTV Video Music Award performance in August, but that's a tribute to Madonna kissing Britney Spears. Let's put it like that. So he's doing what he wants. It's his choice. And there's nothing that's going to stop him. That guy's just too big. He sells out every show. He's out there, and he's just doing a big deal. And Washington Post put a big story on him. Pouring across the whole board. Now, one more thing I want to bring up here. Oh, well, two more things. And there's other stories I wanted to bring up that I was going to bring up this week, but I'm going to, I'm going to table them. About TikTok and podcasting and uh, various other things. YouTube content creators. I'll bring that up probably next week. But I got two other stories to bring up to close out my argument here. On the counterculture and how crossover was so important for counterculture to get to the limelight. Because remember, we are divided now. When there's stuff on the internet... It doesn't cross over into mainstream. And if it does, it's so controlled and so contrived, it's not the same. But there was a time where counterculture could find its way into mainstream culture. But it's not being allowed now. Instead, it's being gentrified. Mainstream is now becoming, well, you have certain people represented, but it has to be the way that we want it represented. Not the way that everyone in the world wants it represented. Like, the melting pot. You understand? There's this whole thing where mainstream, they're going to betray things the way they think it should be. We're going to incorporate and represent people that are gay or black or Hispanic or Indian or Asian or whatever. I mean, we never even talk about K-pop and the popularity of that music into this market. We never talk about martial art movies that are still iconic today that crossed over into America and became very popular. But we don't talk about that part. There's a show from the, there's a the story from the root.com back in 2017 that talked about this. That's how far back we got to go. And the story talking about black led TV shows have always had crossover appeal. Why the side piece treatment? Because he noticed the same change here. At the time, Nielsen had a study in 2017 of February that acknowledgement that black people play a pivotal role in shaping various sectors of popular culture in the U.S. And 73% of non-Hispanic whites, 67% of Hispanics, believe that African Americans influenced mainstream culture. Because it did. All over the place. And now several programs with a predominantly black cast or main storyline are focusing on a black character are drawing substantial non-black viewership. They talk about the show This Is Us. Blackish. Secrets and lies. How to get away with murder. And scandal. Having predominantly non-white audiences. When they talk about secrets and lies, excuse me, uh, so blackish. The show has a 79% of non-black viewership at that time in 2017. How to get away with murder, 69% non-black. Scandal, 
It doesn't show how much it was. But again, oh, 68%. Oh, and 75% for Secrets and Lies, which was with Michael Ely was uh, the star on that show. Again, same thing. How about Insecure? With Issa Rae, 61% non-black. Atlanta with Donald Glover, 50% non-black. That's the way it was. Empire, same way. Predominantly not black. Crossover shows. Now, in this story, they talk about the fact that, okay, so should I be thrilled about this news that could have easily been packaged with the hashtags of TBT or hashtag Throwback Thursday or Flashback Friday? Sorry, Nielsen, but I do decline. To be fair, Nielsen does know that television shows such as Jefferson, San Francisco, and Cosby Show have already proved that our shows can be watched by all. But Nielsen offers the addendum. What's unusual now is the sheer number of such programs that are carrying cross-cultural appeal. So Nielsen, much like Billboard, was a gauge that shows you shows could reach a full audience. And it doesn't have to be pandered to one audience. Or that you isolate or alienate the rest of the audience that's not like you on the show. Right. So we know that the truth of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and the truth of the 2010s, what will networks do about it? Will they continue to be more inclusive than their background? They could. After all, it would be nice to see more in terms of class, gender, and sexual orientation. We may be seeing more of us on television, but it's still not all of us. Maybe networks will finally embrace the stubborn reality and keep a great thing going. Well, have they done that? No. By the way, how many of those shows are still on right now? Atlanta's still on, right? I think Insecure, didn't they finish their last season? Scandal's been gone. Shauna Ryan's moved along to Netflix, so he's got shows over there. Secrets Lies only lasts like one season. Blackish is still out there, and they moved to Mixish, and now it's spun off. But how many more shows are like that? <clears throat> now, recently got Abbott Elementary, but like, really, how many more shows do we have that are like that? The Wonder Years? Okay. But there's not much. Now, in this rude story, they also talk about how I do know if a few black shows can claim crossover appeal, an increased volume ought to yield a similar result. Us black folks are pretty diverse, don't you know? I mean, clearly, Negro, American had Negro fatigue, as evidenced by the new man of the White House, but if the Cosby show in a different world could thrive as trifling Ronald Reagan hollered about welfare queens and, uh, welfare queens and crack, Donald Glover, Isa Ray, Kerry Washington, and Viola Davis can maintain success under a, man, a mismanaged terrorist reign. I don't know who they're talking about, Minamane Mao. I don't know who that is. <clears throat> but anyway, will they continue to be more inclusive? And then, you know, this writer says they're hopeful because all, all hope is all we have. So, somebody feels like what we're getting right now is not enough. Like, there's enough no inclusivity, not enough inclusion. Not enough gender and diversity. Really? I don't know. Your network TV has it. Your mainstream culture is doing it. Is your counterculture? Maybe not so much. It's probably out there, but not as prominent. So, I don't understand what this writer's asking for. Like, what more do you want? The audience is intended are to be black, but we don't realize that the entire audience out there is not. It's everybody. <clears throat> because that's what we want. We entertained. We enjoy the content. So what's wrong with that? And they figured there was a problem with that. I don't know. I don't think there is, but there's a lot of good TV shows. A couple of those I know myself because I was a big fan of first two seasons of How to Get Away with Murder. I watched Scandal all the way through. Even when it got really bad at the end. But the first like four seasons, man, Scandal was rocking. Olivia Pope. How can you not enjoy that character? She was good. They just made her so damn powerful. That's the problem with that Scandal. They got her like to be so damn powerful. She was like controlling the presidency. And I was like, man, it just gave her everything. I'm like, there's no more fun in that because she was like so good when she was fighting her way up. But they did a different story. But something to be said about all that's going on here. And I'll tell you, um, I don't know. People just don't realize how good we've had it. Just because there's a certain minority that still thinks it was still not enough. So certain black artists or certain Hispanic artists or certain Asian artists 
they find their way up remember sign gangnam style novelty song number one song by the way number one all of a sudden here we got what about bts number one it happens across the board and people just don't realize that but hey <clears throat> what am i supposed to say about it i think i put out a great argument i hope i laid it out for you and i hope you enjoyed what i talked about here much different i want crossover back look is it perfect no because you think like the people that need to be controlling it should be like whatever well not everything's gonna be like soul train where it was all black controlled and black owned and even that show catered maybe it was accidentally but it was to a non-black to a non-black audience as well because people went there to go see elton john <laughs> and david bowie and tina marie and gina vanelli and dennis coffee and all these others how it was that's the show for tonight thank you for listening to the show thank you for checking in so appreciating that you want to go and catch this show come back next week for another broadcasters podcast because remember content is king and the control of your content is in your hands thank you for listening to the broadcasters podcast Find all the links to subscribe to the show by going to broadcasterspodcast.com. And don't forget to check out the King of Podcasts wrestling program, The Wrestling Is Real Podcast, exclusively at wrestlingisreal.com. 